Hello, everyone. Good evening once again. Thank you for joining our third series of Secure Pensions Trust webinar series. We are delighted to have you all on board. Um, sorry for the late start. We're waiting for a few people to join us, but I believe we can start now. Um, okay, so my name is Mildred Sophia Atal. I'll be your host for this evening's program, and I trust that we'll have an interesting and educative time. So I would like to introduce our guest speaker, who happens to be the Business Development and Corporate Affairs Manager at the Chartered Institute of Bankers Ghana. He has over seven years experience in the main banking stream. He's a member of the Chartered Institute of Bankers. He's an advocate for savings and is an authority figure in the personal financial managing, management space. He's no stranger to regular viewers of the TV3 News 360. And we are deeply honored and privileged to have Mr. Patrick Ba Abankwa as our guest this evening. Good evening, Mr. Abankwa. Good evening, Mildred. Nice to have you joining us this evening. Trust you are doing well. Oh, by the grace of God, we are we are doing well. Okay, that's good to hear. Okay, so thank you for joining us and making time to join us to have this talk show on our on how to manage financial our financial issues during this challenging trying times that we are facing. So I would not want to waste time. Our dear audience, I present to you our guest speaker, Mr. Bankwa. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mildred, and the team at uh, Secure Pension. Uh, it's a privilege that um, I've been given the opportunity to uh, have a, a discussion on how we can prepare ourselves in the, um, times like this. Uh, if you permit me, I would like to share my screen for the presentation this evening. So, um, uh, can I be given the right to share the screen? Um, so can the IT team help with that? I'm trying to share, but it says I, I can't share. I think you are someone is sharing the screen. Okay, so let me try it again. Okay. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Is, is it visible? Can we all see it? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So um, I think the topic is And I believe that uh, we all appreciate uh, what's happening around uh, Ghana and the world at large. Um, just this uh, afternoon, I was just checking the news and I realized that the inflation rate for June ending was 29.8%. 29.8%. When you do a cumulative inflation between the beginning of the year, that's January to now, it's around 22, 23%. What that means is that even before we start uh, the session, if you were paid 3,000 cities in January as your net, by the end of June, the actual value of that 3,000 has been shrunk and reduced to about 2,100, even before any other thing is considered. That should tell you the actual impact of the economy on you and I, our pocket and our finances. So it's important that sessions like this, we all involve ourselves. It's going to be an interactive session. Um, by the end of the presentation, if you have any question, please bring it on board. Let's all discuss, uh, bring our ideas on how we can structure ourselves, especially for the second half of the year, which we are already in on the seventh month. So this is going to be the outline of my presentation. I'm going to define what personal financial planning means why we need to do that, the benefit of having a, a personal financial plan, um, how we, we go about that. Then we also zoom into financial discipline and independence. Then we look at the main topic, which is savings and investment, how to start a financial plan. Then I also touch on a few uh, common money excuses that we give ourselves. Many people don't save or invest for some uh, of time to look at that. Then of course, we will take home some lessons that 
will be a guide between now and um, December 2022. So um, I always start my presentation with um, images. So we can see on the screen two images. Um, one, we have a little girl with um, spaghetti all over her mouth and her body. Then one, we also see someone um, dumping used food into a, a, a dustbin. Now let's take the first image. This is a young lady that is virtually, I mean, wasting food that has been given to her. And I, under the two images, I have attitude of most people. And when I say attitude of most people, what I'm trying to say is here is that just like the little girl, most of us earn so much money, but we end up wasting the money because we, there's no plan for that money. So the question is, the mother of the child, if the mother could plan to know exactly how much this young lady needs in terms of the food that she wants to eat, she would have served the young lady the exact quantity that she needs. But in this case, we can see the young lady destroying the, the, the excess food that she doesn't really need. The same way in the other side of the uh, screen, we see someone, I mean, dumping leftover food. Most of us treat our finances with this, the same as these two images. One, we don't, because we don't have a plan, we end up having excesses when it comes to our expenses. Two, we also end up destroying our personal finances by doing things that does not add value to our lives. So it's important that uh, as we listen to this session, the first thing I want all of us to do, including myself, is that when we are going through financial challenges, the first person we need to blame is ourselves. If you don't take the blame that your finances are not going well because of a decision that you took, whether it was a major decision or a minor decision, there's no way you can progress and there's no way you'll be able to solve that particular problem. Now let's go into the, the main topic, which is personal financial planning. And I've just given a few definitions. I want to just take one or two of them. It says that personal financial planning involves your money as well as savings and investments. It means that when you talk of personal financial planning, we are referring to things relating to your pocket, money, money that comes into your hand. And when the money comes into your hand, what do you do with that money? And that's what personal financial plan is all about. And I'm saying that it includes budgeting, banking, insurance, mortgage, investment, retirement planning, and estate planning. By the end of the session, I will touch on a few of the areas that goes into personal financial planning. So budgeting, I'm going to talk about budgeting this evening. Banking, so if you are working, where do you keep your money? Do you keep your money under your pillow or you run it through the bank or a financial institution? If you are running through the financial institution, what are the things that you consider so that you won't have the experience that others had some few years back? If you are doing insurance as a personal financial product, how are you going about it? All of these come together to form what we call personal financial plan. So what is it in terms of definition? We are saying that it's a systematic approach where an individual maximizes the existing financial resources. Existing financial resources means here your revenue, your income. You maximize the profit that you get from your income through proper management of your finances. And why are you doing this? The goal is to achieve financial freedom, financial freedom. And I'm saying that the end result, if you plan your life financially well, then it means that you have been able to set goals for yourself by the end of this session, I expect that all of us will have financial goals between July this month and December 2022. It's very important that we set goals. And I will tell you why it's important. When you set goals, it directs your path. If you set goal to, let's say, save 500 CDs every month, no matter how difficult it is, you will still find ways and means to save that 500 because you know that's a priority. And the goal that you are setting here should have a target. What is the purpose of that goal? So I'm saying that personal financial goals involve having enough for your short-term financial needs, planning and retirement, and saving for your child's education. So if you are a parent on this call, one of your goals should be looking after your children and their education. If you set that goal, your question you need to ask yourself is that if your child is going to 
let's say they invest in five years time, 10 years time, how much money do you think you will need to be able to cater for the education without struggling, without going to the bank? That's a goal that you set for yourself. And that includes what we mean by personal financial planning. Now, why do you have to do this personal financial planning? And that's the main reason why we are on this call. The first is that you want to set right financial goals. If you don't plan your life financially, you cannot have goals to meet. And if you don't have goals to meet, you always be working and complaining because there's no point of accountability. Another reason why you need to have a personal financial plan is that you have to prepare for the unknown and uncertain tomorrow, like what you are going through this year. I'm sure when we started the year 2020, none of us anticipated anything like COVID. But COVID hit all of us. It affected people's uh, income streams. That's an unknown. Nobody planned for it. If you don't have a personal financial plan, an unknown like that can take you off guard, which can even destroy your, whole, your life. It can destroy your plans. So that's the unknown and the uncertain tomorrow. As you are all going through this, uh, challenges, financial challenges, inflation, and all that. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. Tomorrow may be worse. So if you say that today, because you are going through challenges, you will not save, you will not invest, thinking that tomorrow will be better. It's possible that tomorrow will, will be worse. So it's important that at every stage that you find yourself, you do personal financial planning. And that's why Benjamin Franklin said that by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. So if you fail to prepare today with the excuse that you don't have money, things are hard. It means that you are already preparing to fail tomorrow. So that's another reason why we have, we need to have a personal financial plan. Again, it improves decision making. When you set goals ahead of you and you are moving towards the goal, everything that you, you do, every step that you take will be geared towards that goal. And it helps you to make quick decisions. So for example, assuming you are saving 500 cities, as I said, for your child's education, next year you will keep in mind that the moment you decide not to save that 500 cities in a month is going to jeopardize your child's ability to go to school next year so therefore you are always on track and that's what we mean by improved decision making because you have a plan it will help you to take the right decisions at every point in time again it helps to create value for the next generation i keep saying that if you have a child or your parent and you don't leave a good legacy in terms of financial freedom for the next generation, you, are, you didn't do much for, for the children. And that's why we need to have a plan. I love this quote from Maya. It says that if you are going to leave, leave a legacy, make a mark on the world that can't be erased. So as a father, as a, a guardian, the reason why you need to create value for the next generation with a financial plan is that even when you leave, your legacy will still be around even whilst you are dead. And that's what Maya says. And also a very good point when it comes to having a, a personal financial plan. Now, what are the benefits? We've looked at why we need to do it. The benefit is that one, I've already mentioned some, it gives you defined financial goals. It creates stability. Even when things around you are not going well, because you have a plan, you are always stable. You're able, able to think and plan for tomorrow. It helps you to manage your income and track your expenses. We are going to look at that, how to track your expenses. Many of us, in, the, in spite of the inflation and all that, there are things that we can do to limit or reduce the burden. And that's what I mean by tracking your expenses. So you have a plan, be able to manage your income and also track your expenses. Let me say at this point that it is not how much you earn that will make you comfortable, but it's what you do with how much you earn that will make you comfortable. Let me repeat it again. It is not how much money you earn that will make you comfortable but it is what you do with how much you earn that will make you comfortable. Keep that in mind, it's very important. Don't think that when your income increases so much, you'll be comfortable, it doesn't work that way. As your income increases, you should keep in mind that your expenses will also increase sometimes times two of how much your income increase. One, like another importance or benefit of having a financial plan is that it offers financial security. When things are tough like now, because you have a buffer, you have a savings account, you have an emergency fund, you are still able to walk through the challenges without having so much toll on you. So that's what we mean by financial security. Then it gives a better understanding of financial situation. It protects you against emergencies like what we are in now, because if you have a buffer 
and your revenue has even gone down, you can still get some money from your emergency fund. Then it helps, helps you to go on early retirement. If you're on this call and you are planning to go on retirement at a 60, then please and please pay attention to our today's discussion. I believe that if you plan your life very well, you commit yourself to a personal pension. By age 50, 55, you should be thinking of going on early retirement. And that can only be possible when you plan your life financially. Then the last one is, of course, it gives you peace of mind. One of the things that causes so much confusion in marriages, apart from infidelity, is money challenges. When you have money at home, everybody's happy. But if there's no money, it creates problem. So one of the benefits of financial planning is that it gives you peace of mind. You don't have to be thinking, waking up at dawn, hey, what am I going to eat? What, what am I going to wear? It gives you peace of mind. And that is not achieved on a silver platter. It goes with some principles that we are going to look at today. Now, how do you draw up or go about your financial plan? The first step that you need to do if you want to draw a financial plan is that you need to have your financial plan with goals. So as I said, your financial plan with, should come with goals, goals that you want to achieve. And in setting your goals, we always go with the SMART rule. The SMART rule says that your goal should be specific, it should be measurable, it should be achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Let me go over it again. Specific means that <clears throat> your goal should be specific. So I want to save, or I want to save for three years to buy a car. It's specific, clear. I want to save for, let's say, or invest for 10 years, move into my own house with that investment. That is specific. It should be measurable. How are you going to achieve that uh, three years or 10 years plan? It means that you want to be saving or investing a certain amount every month. That's what you mean by measurable. Achievable, yes. Is it achievable? Is it really true that within the next three years, we'll be able to save, let's say, 200 cities and still buy a car? Is it achievable? That should go into your goal. So don't set an um, ambiguous goal which cannot be achieved. Then it means that the goal that you are setting from the onset, you are going to fail. Then of course, is it relevant? The target that you set for yourself, is it relevant to you? Will it be beneficial to you? Then the last one is that you should give your time around the, the goal. If you set a goal that oh, I want to, let's say, um, save and invest to the tune of let's say 100,000, and you don't give me the time frame. It doesn't help in financial planning. So you want to do that within, let's say, 10 years. You want to do that within five years. All the goals that you want to set, there should be a time frame so that you work at it. Again, it should be comprehensive. When you are setting up a goal, it should be comprehensive. It should cover, if you are married, it should cover you and your family. It should cover your, your work, working life. That's the professional life and investment goals. Then, of course, when you are done setting your goals, please don't keep it on your laptop. Don't keep it on your phone. I always advise people that the eye that God gave us likes to see things and keep it in memory. So print that plan out. Print it, paste it somewhere. Keep it in a place that you always see so that it will always remind you of what you need to do. Don't keep your plan somewhere that you would never see unless you are going to look for it. No, it should be pasted places that you always see so that it will be a reminder on what you need to do. After you've drawn up your plan, the next stage is what you call execution. Execution. Execution here means that putting the plan into action. It says that a good plan with a bad strategy will fail. Yes, if you draw up the plan which follows the smart rule, all the things measurable, and you don't execute it well, you don't put it into practice well, you fail. So how do you put it into practice? Some of the questions that you need to ask yourself. One, if you want to set up, let's say a pension scheme, or you want to set up a savings account, an emergency fund, the question is, what type of account do you need? Do you need a current account? Do you need a savings account? Do you need an investment account? That's the first question you need to ask yourself when it comes to the execution. What type of investment and insurance product might be necessary? You are asking yourself questions to put it into practice. What type of retirement planning product should I, um, should I deploy? So as we are on this call, Secure Pension has insurance packages. You need to ask yourself, which of the packages that Secure Pension has, 
that I need to buy, that will help me. That is part of the execution. Who will I discuss my progress with? And I always say this, when it comes to personal financial plan, you should have someone that you discuss your progress and even your plans with, people that are knowledgeable. Because if you don't discuss it with people, you end up taking the wrong decisions along the line. So who are you going to discuss that with? I mean, we have a, a, a financial experts around, invest a, a financial advisors around. You can even go to the bank. The bank has people who are, I mean, well qualified to advise you. So who are you discussing these things with? And how do you create a personal uh, a family budget? It's, we are going to look at a budget very soon. But these are the questions that you need to ask yourself when it comes to the execution strategy. The stage. If you don't ask yourself these questions and take the right decision, chances are that you will not be able to meet the goal that is set in the step one. So these are areas that you need to consider when it comes to the execution. Now, three, after you plan how to do the execution, then you kickstart it. You put the actual work into it. So you, one, after deciding on the type of a bank account you want to operate, then you go and open the account. So you want to open the account, the savings account, the investment account. Then you also sign up a retirement product. By the end of the today's session, you should know the kind of investment product, retirement product that you need to sign up. Then insurance product. Insurance also part of financial planning. So insurance is for your, your, your car, your house, your child's education, your life. You have to consider all of this as part of the doing. Then of course, you need to identify the right investment advisor, someone that you discuss your progress with. And all of this goes into the doing. So that's the step three. Then the step four is that you need to also do monitoring and control. So you set 10 years to move from your rented apartment to your own house. You are building towards it. How do you know that you're on track? That's what we call monitoring and control. So some people do it six months, one year, every month. You track, okay, you said you're going to, by June, build up, let's say, 3,000 Ghana cities into your investment account for your building. As of June, have you been able to achieve it? If you have not achieved it, what are the causes? How do you make amends? That's what you mean by monitoring and control. And all of these things I'm talking about, they are not paperwork. They are not just uh, rhetoric. They are not things that we, we just have to say it and go by it. They are things that you need to put them into practice. So you have to plan the execution strategy and review them. Review the, your budget. Monitor your investment returns periodically. So a bank promises you that they are going to give you 19%. Periodically, check whether indeed the returns on your account is 19%. Don't say that because they are experts, so they will do the right thing. I have seen banks do mistakes when it comes to investment returns because the one who was booking the investment used a wrong rate. Instead of 17%, the person used 13%. But if you don't monitor, you don't verify, you don't check these things as an investor, you wouldn't spot it, you wouldn't know it. And that's what I mean by monitor your investment returns. Then of course, where there are variances, where there are gaps between what you plan and what you actually achieve, you have to make amends, correct them. How do you correct them? Either you go back and check where you, you, you fell sh uh, short, like what you are going to learn today. The challenge is inflation. Even though inflation has reduced your purchasing power, you still want to buy the same quantity. It's going to affect your savings uh, uh, plan. Because of course, you want to satisfy your needs first before you go to your investment. And by the time you are done satisfying your needs, there's nothing left for the investment. So that can create a variance that you need to correct with time. And that's what we mean by you are monitoring and controlling. So let me go right again. When it comes to building your uh, plan, one, you need to draw up your plan with goals. Two, you need to develop how you are going to execute the plan. Then three, you do the execution with the right bank, the right uh, retirement product, the right insurance product, and the right advisor. Then four, as you go about this particular pattern, you once in a while go back to check whether you are on track. If you are married, you sit down with your spouse, you discuss, okay, we said we're going to do this, we're going to do that, where are we now? Are we making progress? If you're not making progress, how do you call for help? And that's what you mean by the monitoring and control. So these are the four stages that goes with having a personal financial planning. Now, a personal financial plan will not work, and listen, it will not work if you lack self-discipline. And here is very key. If you lack self-discipline, the plans that you set for yourself, 
the monitoring and all that will not work. It will not work. So what is financial discipline? It's your ability to spend and to save within your income. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do, but I believe that that is where most of our problems come from. Our inability to discipline ourselves to spend and to save within our income because of economic challenges, because of excuses. Again, I'm saying that financial discipline leads to what? How you're able to conform your spending and savings to the plans that you have set in order to achieve your financial goals. How you're able to marry the two, your spending and your savings in order to achieve your financial goal is what we call financial discipline. And I'm saying that financial discipline is not something that you can do overnight. You have to master it with time. So for example, personally, when it comes to savings, in the past, I used to um, do standing order on my account. So standing order means that the bank will deduct the portion I want to save. I realized that, okay, the so bank was doing that, but it gets to a time that the month or the day that they need to do the deduction, it doesn't come through. Then something will come up. Then I'll have to go and take the money. And when the, when the time is up, the bank will call me that there's no money, no money in the account. It means that at some point, I realized I was having some challenges. So then in some of the investment, I sign up Momo. So when the month ends, I get my salary. I do the Momo myself, not waiting for the bank to deduct on their own time because I wanted to be disciplined. So discipline is mastered over time. And I've done it for some years now. So now I understand how some of these things work. So if you also want to practice it, you have to do it little by little, pin yourself. Go one step at a time. Don't try to jump the gun just because you have heard about financial discipline. So you want to stretch yourself. No, it is something that is mastered over time. It's mastered over time. And I'm saying that most of us, we have the financial indiscipline from our roots. When we're children, we all know that as a child, when your, 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 your child, as a father, if your child comes to you and says that, Dad, I, need, I want to go and buy yogurt. First thing you do is that, oh, take this man, go and buy yogurt. Uh, okay, so I want to go and buy this. I want to go and buy that. You give it to your child. One of the things that the, the, the child is learning from you is that they associate money with spending. So they think that once they are giving money, they have to spend it. They don't understand or they, they are not giving the training that there's time for everything. There are days that you want the money, you won't get it because that has to use the money for something else. But because we always want to make kids happy, we tend to drive this. Uh, perception of money is equal to spending in them. And as we grow with that mentality, anytime we are giving money, we think that when we spend it to become happy. And that's what I mean by conditional uh, spending habit. And something that psychologists have, have, have written so much on it. And they are saying that it is from how we're born and how we're trained. So it's something that if you are listening, you're, you're a, a, a father or a, a mom, you need to begin to teach your children as early as they are. So that you begin to appreciate that money is not only for spending, but you can also use money to set goals in future. So this is what I said from the beginning, this particular slide. I'm saying that if you don't accept blame for your financial difficulties, there's no way you can make progress. If you put the blame on the government, if you put the blame on the economy, you put the blame on everybody except you, you will not make progress. You will not have the agency to take certain tough decisions in this particular season that we are in. So how do you draw up a financial discipline habit? The first thing that will help you to develop financial discipline is what you call personal expenses budget. Personal expenses budget. It's a very simple budget. All of us on this call can do it. So I've just given you a snapshot of how it looks like. So you have your income, you have your budget, and you have your expenses. You may decide not to go with your budget, but let me just explain from income and expenses. So you just have to create a, two columns. You can take a sheet, you can use an Excel sheet, you can use an A4 to do this particular thing. And I believe that as you're on this call, we're trying it at home. So draw up the budget by having your income side. So your income, how much money are you earning? If you're a business person, you also be revenue. So as you get your revenue, after all your expenses, what are you left with? How much are you paying yourself? You put it there. If you are working for someone, you put your salary there. If you are married and your spouse has 
another income line. You add it up. That becomes your total income. Then you break the income into your expenses. And that's where you state, okay, I want to save, let's say, 10% of my total income every month for the A, B, C, D goal. I want to spend 200 CDs out of the total income for T and T. I want to do that. I want to do that. And ensure that when you are done, it's, it's adding up. That is what we call personal budget. And that is the first and most trusted source when it comes to developing financial discipline. If you don't have the personal financial uh, uh, budget, then you haven't even started the journey at all. Because if you think that you can spend and save some, it would never work. You can't spend and save some. You have to save and spend the rest. That is how it works. Because there will always be something for the money in terms of a need. So that is how you need to also structure yourself. The first one is that have the budget. So 2022, I've just designed this a personal budget I've designed that I will, I've given to my followers. So you can just look at it. If you want it outside this meeting, I can send it to you. So this is a, a typical proper budget for a whole year. So you can see the income side. You can see the expenses side. You can see from January to December. And when you check the quota, quota here, I've been able to structure how much I think each, each person or each item should go in terms of its impact on your income. So for example, I am saying that, depending on where you stay, 15% of your income should be the maximum that should go into your rent. Food, I said 15%, entertainment, 5%. I've broken it down, including your investment and savings, 10%. You have this thing printed and it will be your guide. And by the time we are done with this session, you understand how you can tweak some of the expenses as and when things become difficult. The second thing you need to do after your budget is that you need to know your weakness. All of us on this call, we all have weaknesses, things that easily drain our expenses. For example, some people, the moment they see pizza, whether it's their last money on them, they have to buy it. That is your weakness. You can see the little boy trying to push that big track, he can never push it because he doesn't have the strength. You need to know what drains your expenses and you work at it. If you don't know your weakness, your weakness will always overcome you. When it comes to spending, everybody has a particular thing that draws them to spend more than what they budgeted for. So you need to know your weakness. And once you see your weakness, you begin to work at it. The third thing when it comes to financial discipline is that don't allow people to put pressure on you, societal perception, what people expect of you, even though you don't have the funds for it, because people expect that you do this particular thing. So you want to do it to appease society. When you are hungry at home, society will not be there. When you actually need society to assist you, to help you, that is when you get to realize that, no, You've taken the wrong decision. Don't allow people to pressurize you, whether you, you are in a, a particular group, whether in the society, whether in your neighborhood, whether your church, whether your workplace, don't allow people to put pressure on you. When your financial goal does not match with what they are saying, the expectation should not be your expectation. It is what you are planning for yourself. So that's another thing that you need to do when it comes to financial discipline. Then of course, I'm saying that save and invest, and that goes to your budget. In your budget line, make sure you have a portion for savings and investment, no matter what. You can decide to, let's say, because of difficulties, you reduce it from, let's say, 10% to, let's say, 5 It is good. Don't reduce it to zero. Never do that. Then get a financial advisor, as I said, for accountability. In this discipline journey, sometimes you can be taken off guard. You, you forget yourself because of the challenges. But once you have people that you discuss your finances with, of course, people that you trust, it always comes back to put you on your toes. So I'm saying that we need to get a financial advisor to help you in line. So you can see the boxer with the trainer. I'm sure if they stand to fight today, the boxer will be the trainer in, in a, a typical fight. But he has lowered himself, he has humbled himself to learn from the trainer. That's what we mean by financial advisor. It doesn't mean that the person knows too much more than you, but you lower yourself to be trained, to listen to wisdom. And that's what I mean by the point number five. So these are examples of um, the trainer and the coach. Now, as part of the financial discipline brings us to the savings, as I said, in drawing your budget, you need to have a savings portion of it. 
Now, the typical savings that you and I will do is that we have our income after spending. What is left is what we call savings. That is not savings. Savings is typically that part of your income that you don't spend immediately. And this is the equation that you should all practice if you want to build up your life financially. It should be your income minus savings equal to expenses. So when you take your income, if you're a Christian, for example, you take your tithe out of the income, the next thing you take out of it before you even sign up the check and go and buy things from the market or any other place is your savings. And as I said, this savings is not just money you are going to put into your account for you to be sitting there. These are money that you're putting into an investment uh, scheme, insurance, and all that. So that's what I mean by savings. So you should make sure your savings is taken first before you spend any other thing. So that's the proper savings plan. And that is part of the financial discipline that I mentioned earlier on. And I love this quote by Jack Benny. He says that, try to save something while your salary is small, because it is impossible to save after you begin to earn more. If you don't develop the habit of saving now, no matter your income now, and you put the perception that, okay, I'm waiting to get more money before I save, it will not work. More money brings more trouble. That's how it works. So I always give you this example. Some years back, um, we were having arguments on campus at the University of Ghana. So we we're talking about money and all that. Then I told my friends that it's only a fool. Please uh, forgive for, for the word I'm using. That's what I said, exactly what I said on campus. I said, it's only a fool who will buy a phone which is more than 800 cities back then, about 28 or so. Because I thought that 800 cities was so huge a money that someone should use that to buy a phone, one particular phone, that it will just get destroyed. I said that. Fast forward. So just some few, few years back, I had to buy an expensive phone for the work that I do. When I finally got the phone, then the saying that I made some years back came back to me, dawned on me, that I said that if you buy a phone more than 800 cities, you are a fool. And now I am buying something that's even more than eight times two times three. Why am I saying this? As your income increases, your expenses also increase. If you don't develop the habit to save now, no matter your income, and you want to defer it to some future, when the future comes, your taste will also change. What you like will change. The phone, you buy that yam phone again, you are going to buy an expensive phone. So you learn it now whilst you are any small and whilst you are in difficult situations. Once you are able to get that habit, no matter how much you earn, you will still be able to save and your savings will either be increasing and not decreasing. And that's what Jack Benny says, and it's a tested fact. I am a, a living testimony to that. Now, most of us, in spite of the challenges we are facing today, the economic challenge that we are still complaining, we still spend so much money on some of these gadgets. We are always buying new things. We are always buying new bars, buying new cars, flashy cars that we don't even have money to fuel. And these are the things that will make you poor if you don't manage them. I'm not saying spending is, is bad, it's not bad, but if you don't manage these two against your goals, your financial goals, you will not be able to make headway in this financial journey. So I, I spoke about this uh, conditional responses as something that we learned when we were young, according to psychologists. Now, how do you start this journey? How do you start this journey in this difficult situation? The challenges that we face ourselves. One, we need to match your goals to the right investment products. As you turn your savings into investment, you need to make sure you are, you are matching up your goals with the product that is right for you. So I'm talking of, for example, savings account. What's the purpose? It's for day-to-day -day expenses. So after you invested your savings a portion for the month, then whatever is left for your expenses, you keep it in the savings account. Then the next one is what? A fixed deposit account. If you have a target, for example, you want to buy a house, rent, home renovation, car, you can decide to channel that amount that you are saving every month into a fixed deposit. So that's a, a goal that you set for yourself and the account that, or the investment product that goes with it. Then of course, all of us must begin to plan for our retirement. Retirement uh, planning does not start at age 50. It starts the first day you earn your salary. That's when retirement planning starts. So you need to have a retirement plan, which you call the personal pension fund, which secure pension has a good product. I'm sure by the end of the session, Mildred will, will take us through some few details about it. We need to have that. Whether it's your first day at work, 
or you are, is, you have about five years to retire, you need to have a personal uh, 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 a pension fund. Just yesterday, I got a call from someone who follows me on Facebook, and she went to retirement some few years back. Her money has been locked up in a financial institution, and the money that she's receiving from SNIT, when she takes off some few expenses, medical expenses, she's virtually led to nothing because she didn't build up a personal pension in addition to SNIT. So it's something that we all need to take into consideration and be serious about it. Of course, as part of your investment product to try and add insurance, emergencies, life eventualities, do insurance for a parent, do insurance for yourself, your children, because nobody knows tomorrow. The tomorrow can just be tomorrow as we are talking about, or even 10 years. But if you don't plan for it, against some of these eventualities, please, it can drain up your money. FUNA will come, and by the time you, are, you, are, you realize all your savings has been pushed into the FUNA because you do not do an insurance for against death. So that's the first one. You match your goals with the right investment product. Two, it says that do not equate your retirement fund to a risky investment. When it comes to retirement, please, it is not a time for you to go and do cha-cha, trying to go with the mindset that the higher the risk, the higher the returns. No, you can do the higher the risk, the higher the return with fixed deposit. When it comes to investment, a, a, a retirement uh, investment, you make sure you channel it through the pension house so that it will build up gradually. Else, any mistake with that, your retirement fund will lead you to suffer on retirement. And don't, don't forget, on retirement, that's where you will need more money in terms of your medical expenses. So if you don't have anything on retirement, most people die on retirement only because of monetary uh, pressures. They're always thinking because the money that they have cannot be cater for themselves and they are only building up their retirement around their children. You end up that find, find out that by the time you're on retirement, your child is also now looking after his or her, her children. He's also busy. So the money that you're expecting as retirement from your children will not come. So don't risk your retirement fund into ventures that do not really give the, the required returns. And one good thing about having a pension fund is that it works with the issue of compound interest. And I'm going to show you how that works. It's very simple. Now the compound interest is simply means that you are building up interest on interest. So unlike the normal investment, so you invest, you earn, you earn your interest, let's say six months time, if you want to roll it over, you add the interest to the principal and roll it over again. When it comes to personal pension, because you are contributing every month, Every month, the principal and the old principal are adding up plus their interest, and it's being rolled over again on monthly basis, on monthly basis. And that's what we call the magic of compound interest. And I'm going to show you a particular table. That is the figure that I even use, the rate that I even use today, if you are using the same rate, it will be more than that. Let's just look at this table. And this one works with personal pension, planning for retirement. Now, with this table, let me just walk you through. I have some few minutes before. We open up for questions. This table says that we have 10 years plan, 20 years plan, 25 years plan, 30 years plan. Assuming that we are even using the rate of 15%. And today, most of the personal pension uh, schemes charge more than 15% because treasury bill, as we speak, is around 23, 24. So the 2015 I'm seeing here will be more than that. But let me just use this one for demonstration purposes. If you decide to have a personal pension for 10 years and you are contributing 20 CDs every month, 20 CDs every month, for 10 years, by the end of the 10th year, you have gathered 5,376 CDs at the rate of 15%. And I'm saying that this 15%, I did this table some two years ago. Now it will be more than 5,000. But let's just stick with the, the uh, 15%. If you do the same for 20 years, that will give you 28,000. If you do the same for 25 years, that will give you 61,000. If you do the same thing for 30 years, that's 131,000. So assuming you are 40 years today and you want to do this for 20 years till you go on retirement and you just want to start with something small, 20 cities, that's 28,000. If you do 50 cities, 
The same, you can see the, the, the margin for you go from 13,000, 72,000, 154,000, and going on and on. If you decide to, let's say, you want to go 400 cities, 400 cities in 10 years' time, you'd have gotten 107,000. 20 years' time, you go in 576,000. 25 years' time, 1.2. If you go 30 years, 2.6. And I know someone will say, uh, but inflation at that year will not be that much. So it means that this money will lose value. The good thing about personal pension is that every year you can adjust your contribution by inflation. So please listen to it well. Every year, if you are someone who wants to get the same value, you can adjust your, your contribution by inflation. So for example, by the end of the year, if inflation was 30% and you are paying 20 cities, you can decide to adjust the 20 cities by 30%. And that will give you somewhere around, let's say 23, 24 cities or so. You will still get your value that you want at the period that you set for yourself. And that's a good thing about personal pension. You have control over how much you want to build up and the value of that money. So inflation does not come in because you can always build up the fund and the contribution year on year. So that is how it works. So this is a simple table from 50 cities, 20 cities up to 40, 400 cities. You can decide to do more than that at, at will. Now, if you do that, assuming the same table that we looked at, if you did that and you take your money in 10 years time, 15 years time, 20 years time, and you want to invest in treasure bill at the rate of 15%, you don't want to go and do any risky business. If you do that for 10 years and invest in, um, let's say, treasure bill, and you are contributing about 400 cities, it means that at 15%, every month you can go for a thousand trade in addition to your SNIT. That's if you did 400 cities for 10 years. If you did 400 cities for, let's say, 20 years, every month you can go for your 7,000 from the bank as interest that you have on your investment that you mobilize for 20 years. If you did that for, let's say, 25 years, you'll be able to earn 15%, 15,000 at even the rate of 15%. If you did that for, let's say, three, uh, 30 years, every month with 400 cities contribution, you may be earning around 32,761 cities on retirement. And that money will be able to meet your medical bills and make you comfortable. And as I said, even this one is 15%. It can be more with the current rate that we are using. With that said, I know someone will be on the call and will say that, oh, but this one, we have heard it before. So we are going to talk about some excuses that we give when it comes to money. We'll go through the session, but some excuses that we give ourselves when it comes to savings and investment. The first excuse we give, I've already mentioned, is that I don't have enough money. So we, we will not save, we will not invest because of economic challenges, because of this and that. So we don't have enough money. My brother, my sister, on this call, it is not an excuse. If you decide not to save, it is because you have decided not to save, not because you don't have money. Even if you decide that to save even 10 cities, 20 cities, the table I just showed you will give you something in future. And that 20 cities, if you don't save it, chances are that in 10 years time, you wouldn't even know what to use that 20 cities for some 10 years ago. So it's money that you waste them without a accountability. So that money that you are going to waste without accountability, why don't you push it into a personal pension? So that's the first excuse, I don't have enough money. Two, you only live once. You only live once. As we read from Maya, the quote, when you leave a legacy, it means that you are not living once. You are giving the next generation something to always thank you for. So you don't live once, you live forever. Then I don't have time for side hustle. There are some people that based on the work that you do, and I mean, the, the income that you are earning, no matter how you strain yourself to save, it is still difficult. That is when side hustle comes in making time to ensure that we can do some small, small side hustle, even weekend jobs, little, little job teaching and here and there. You can just do something and that's what you call side hustle. But another excuse people give is that even though I don't have enough money, I also don't have time. All of us have time. If you decide that you want to do something with your extra time, you can always do that. Then I will save for my retirement later. So you are 30 years, you tell yourself, I will save when I'm 40 years. When you're 40 years, you tell yourself, I'll say 150 years, please. The retirement plan is start today from this session. You start today. Then you also say that I'm doing better than my friend. Please, you are not in the competition with anybody. Your friend stays at his, his house. You also stay at your, at your home. 
if you're having challenges, you can't go and compare yourself with your friend. You can be in the same company with the same salary. Your friend may have just a child. You may have four children. Don't say that what he's buying is what, what you also buy because you are not the same. So don't compare yourself with people for you to feel better than them. No, draw up your own financial plan and work at it. That is what you should focus your attention on. Then of course, the most funniest of all the excuses we give sometimes is that I've been cursed with money. Nobody has cursed you with money, my friend. My friend. Nobody has cursed you. It's your decision that you've taken that has led you to where you are now. It's a decision that you, you took some years back that has caused you your pain now. There are two decisions that you can take, omission and commission. Commission here means something that you did that brought you to where you are now, that is giving you the challenges. And the second thing is that something that you ought to have done that you didn't do can also lead you into some financial challenges. So these are basically some financial excuses that we give ourselves. Now, let's just take something home after the discussion that you had. And I, I call them the take home from this session. One, focus on your needs in times like this. In challenges, challenging moments like this, as inflation is wiping away our purchasing power, please focus on your needs, not your wants. Things that you can't do without, so let's say food, water, tea and tea, these are needs, focus on them and put your wants somewhere for some time. If you draw up your budget and there's always a portion for your want, please keep that want somewhere waiting for things to stabilize before you use it. Don't focus on what you want around this time. Focus on your needs. Two, in difficult times like this, you also need to readjust your spending pattern. Readjust your spending pattern. Things that you used to spend your money on, ask yourself, are those things necessary now? Are they critical now? If you buy a shoe every month, Ask yourself, in these challenging moments, is it critical now? Is it important now? And if the answer is no, don't push your fans into it. And I've listed some things that you should focus, for example, food. And I'm saying that if you, you work around a place that food is very expensive, in times like this, you may want to consider taking food from, from the house as lunch, at least maybe three times in a week. For where I, I work at, if you want to be comfortable in the afternoon, I mean, you need to be spending around 30 cities in the afternoon to buy a good food, 30, 40 cities. So if I decide that I'll pick food from home every, let's say, three times in a week, it means that within the week, I'm saving about 90 cities or 120 cities for one week times four. That's over 400 cities that I'm just saving because I decided to look at the conditions that I'm in now and put some strategies around the food that I buy. That is what you can do. Look around. Again, home bills, the bills at home, light bill, water bill, your DSTV and all that. These are times that you need to critically look at them. Those that you can share off, those that you can reduce, so you can reduce your package. If the ACs are always on in the past, now you reduce it. That's what you call man home management, bill management. Then TNT, if for example, I used to buy about 400 cities in January from where I stayed to the office. Now it's almost like times two. And I know other people that are on the call, you're also experiencing the same difficulty. So you can decide that because of how things are going, you drive, let's say, Monday and Fridays. And the other days, you try and take an Uber or take a truck truck just to cushion yourself. This, that is what you need to do when you are in a difficult moment. If you don't do that and you still want to go the same hall, what will happen is that at the end of the day, your financial goal that you set and the savings that you decided to put into the financial goal, you'll not be able to put it in because you end up taking that savings portion and pushing it into the extra fuel, pushing it to the extra food and all that. At the end of the day, you will not be able to meet your financial goals and you begin to have difficulty. You will not have any emergency fund to rely on. And that is for me, will put you in a very tight financial corner. Again, I'm saying that focus your eyes on the goal. If you set up your goal for 10 years, break the goal into weeks, into months, and into years. Track them daily so that you know whether you are on course or you are not on course. Of course, the final thing I want to say is that in this financial planning journey, there's no age limit. You can start as young as you are, or you can start when you're even preparing for retirement. It doesn't matter your age bracket. Once you decide to do it, please take the step now 
and ensure that you fix your eye on the goal within weeks, months, and year. Thank you very much. Mildred. Thank you, Mr. Abankwa. We are really grateful for this time. Um, I, I believe we've learned a lot. I have learned a lot. One of the things I've taken is the fact that it's not what you earn that you, that makes you comfortable. It's what you do with what you've earned. So thank you so much for your time. And we'll take any questions now. Okay, so I see one hand raised. Um, Anthony, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, Anthony, we can hear you. Yes, hello. Okay, Anthony can type your question. So, um, okay, David Asari, please, you can ask your question. Yes, hello. Oh, okay. Uh, please, I wanted to ask this question. Uh, I don't know its impact, but I just want to know. Uh, assuming, let's say I am paying a constant uh, amount to this truck, and my company is also paying some for me, and I want to increase my company's uh, payment, let's say I'm paying 500, my company is paying 500, but I think within the law, an individual can increase his bit uh, to some extent. So I can add 200 to my own so that mine becomes 200, the company owns 500, total 1,002. I just want to ask, doing so, and then maybe uh, adversely, me, setting up a new account and then doing the 200 separately on the side. Is there any advantage in that one? Okay, so um, what, what I'll say is that it depends on where the, your company, the investment that you, you are doing with your company, where they are placing the funds. If they are placing the funds in a high yielding investment on your behalf, then increasing whatever they are doing for you gives you a higher uh, margin. But if where they are investing is the normal investment scheme for you, then I think that you, are, you can start up a personal pension with the 200 series where the compound interest principle applies very well. So that's what I, I would say. But if where they are investing for you still goes with the personal pension formula, then it's better you rather increase it on that side than to go and start another one where the margins will not be that great because it's not huge. Okay, thank you very much. It's your comments that is making me know that there are different streams of uh, you know investment with you guys. Personally, yes, I am not too much aware about it. So I do not know if I can be educated on the various streams you have, I would be happy. No problem. I, I, I think uh, for such a, a discussion, I wish we'll pick it uh, offline because it's, it's a detailed discussion. I'm not sure uh, when we start today, the time that we have, we have limited time, so I'm not too sure I'll be able to uh, fully exhaust everything on this call. No problem. I think my contact and details are supplied, so please, we can arrange and then we can execute. Okay, so that's fine. Thank you. You are welcome, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Asari. 
for your question, you can also contact Secure Pensions as well. We'll be happy to assist in addition to Mr. Bankwa. So we can look for, um, you can get our number in the chat and they can contact us. Okay, so we'll take our next question from Evelyn. Hello. Hello. Yes, Evelyn, you may continue. Sure, if I, I heard you well, uh, the line wasn't so clear. I don't know if you are using uh, hands free. It was giving me some negative feedback. I don't know if um, Mildred um, heard you well, but I'm not sure I heard you, I heard you well. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I think, is it better now, please? Yeah, it's okay now. Yes, so I was asking that um, you were saying when we, we when you create your, your buffer reserve, um, you can go in there when things are a bit tough. And so just going in there for a bit of support. But I'm saying once you're going into that, that reserve, at the end, end of the day, won't it defeat the purpose of the goals that you have set or won't it um, kind of reduce the value of that reserve? And if yes, you are allowed to enter that kind of reserve, what's the most the most prudent number of times you are that team right to go into that reserve for support anytime you think that things are not going but the way you would expect uh, things to go financially? Okay, so if you ask me, um, when it comes to investment, I think when I, I was sharing the screen, one of the points I made was that you should have your goal and account or the type of investment that you want to go with that. So for example, um, you can um, keep your personal pension separated from the emergency fund. So if you want to go in to make any withdrawal for uh, things that are not going on well, then me, for me, if you ask me, you can target the emergency fund. But things like the personal pension, I believe that we should be disciplined not to act will go in to, to take something because we are in some challenges. Let's structure our investment to, to give a portion to the emergency fund where you can always go in as and when you, you need funds to, to support yourself. But the personal pension, which is for your retirement, for me, you should keep it separated from the emergency fund or the normal fixed deposit or the normal savings account that you are running. Evelyn, I don't know if I've been able to offer a, a bit of an advice. Um, yes, please, you, you've been able to. Uh, so as you are saying, we should have the investment account and then we should have the emergency fund. So what kind of um, products should we, are we going to do investment products for emergency funds or you just put it in a savings account or how do you treat emergency funds? Okay, so for me, for emergency fund, you can put it into a treasury bill or fixed deposit account for let's say, and you can have it 91 days, 90 days, 180 days, 182 days, either fixed deposit or um, 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 treasury bill with rollover options. So anytime you need a fund, just go in and stop it and use it for that purpose. Whilst your personal pension will just be topping up and running 
for let's say 10 years, 15 years, depend on how you want to go about it. So that's what I will do. And that's what I do personally. I don't mix the two. When you mix the two, that's where you always be having some difficulty. You end up always liquidating, going into the account, stopping it and all that. It doesn't help. Keep one running for let's say the fixed deposit, three months, six months, which you, in your mind, you know it's for emergency. Then you run the personal pension, which you know is for your retirement. You make them distinct. And in that case, you will not be liquidating or going into any of them anyhow, because there's a plan for, that you have for each of them. Thank you. I think I'm fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take one more from Mr. Muhammadu. Oh, yeah. Hello, please ask your question. Yeah. Hello, good evening. Yes, Um. okay, I'm not uh, asking a question per se, but I'm just appreciating the uh, discussion and also want to add in uh, this thought. You know, um, I've been somewhere where it was said that there are um critical two skills that are not taught in school one is how to make money and the other one is how to spend it so making money is a skill and spending money also a skill which others might have one but might not have the other but it's good if you develop yourself consciously on both instances then you will be keeping yourself afloat uh, thank you. That's what I wanted to pass across. Okay, thank you. So the next we'll take um, Yao Akable. Okay, I think his hand is down. So we'll take questions on the chat. Um, to save time, if you have more questions, kindly type them and then we'll read them out so that we'll have it addressed. So Richard Kade is asking, is it advisable to use your retirement savings to buy land? No, <laughs> no, I don't think it's a, it's a good idea. As I said, the idea for the, the retirement savings is to look or top up whatever you are going to get from SNIT when you are in retirement. If you are buying the land, it means that you are virtually going back to where you started when there was nothing for you. So if unless you are saying that the expenses that you are incurring on rent now is something that you can make more if you own your own property, but for me, if you ask me, I wouldn't advise you to do that. It, it's a very dicey and risky decision to take. Anything at all, you can easily go bad and you find yourself wanting a particular situation like that. So if you ask me, first option, no, don't do it. Okay, so Anthony Zato is asking, I want to find out what your take is on taking a loan. Assuming my company is giving me a staff loan of 5% at 5% per annum, that's quite tempting. What's your take on this? Is it, wise, is it a wise decision to take and invest it or not or any other investment? Okay, so I think I, I responded to it, but, but let me repeat it again. So a staff loan at 5% for me is, is, is very good. But the question we need to ask ourselves is that, do you really need that loan uh, for anything? If there's a need for that particular loan, then you, you can go for it. In the bank where we're giving the same 5% loan, so what some staff were doing, which is financially is, is prudent, is that some were picking the loans and investing at higher rate because, I mean, it's all about returns. So if I can pick a loan at 5%, and easily go to treasury board and invest there and I'm getting less than 23%, then it makes sense. So you can do that. But the question is, you need to have a purpose. Why are you doing it? Do you have an immediate need for it? If you don't have an immediate need, 
Now you just want to turn it around and get margin with, let's say, higher investment. I'm all for it. I think it's a very good that you can also go with. But just be careful and not to be swayed away into such investment. You can, it's a one off investment, but don't, it shouldn't be an everyday uh, plan. plan. Okay. Richard Kade is asking Is buying a foreign currency a good investment, considering the fact that our city is always performing badly against them? Okay. So, foreign currency like the dollar, the pound, it's, it's one of the areas that you can also get exponential growth on your 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 investment. So I mean, it's it's good when you are able to purchase at the right time. It's, for that particular business, it's about the timing. If you don't go in at the right time, you may end up losing value within a matter of days. But if you get an expert advice and you get it at the right time, for you, you think that oh, the dollar is rising, but it may rise at certain times be stable at some, some times and also draw. For example, whenever we get to September, October, or even I guess September, October, where we get the money, the cocoa syndicated loan money comes in, the, the dollar always stabilizes and sometimes the city gain a bit of appreciation against the dollar. So if you bought it around that time and you're expecting the dollar to rise faster than is expected, you may lose out because in the you need agent money and for that matter you need to go and sell your dollar to get city you'll be forced to go and sell it at a, a wrong time and you can also lose value so it's dicey you need to understand the market before you go in unless you don't really have a need for that money for some time let's say one year two years then you can buy the dollars and keep it because we all know that the dollar will not drop 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 that much but within the year when you buy it and when you sell it matters in terms of the value that you have for that money Okay, Deborah Danko is asking, what if you decide to make your personal pension fund an emergency fund? No, I don't think you should make your personal pension your emergency fund. You should create another emergency fund account. Your personal pension, as the name suggests, should be towards your retirement. Don't mix the two. Mm -hmm. I don't I want, like to advise people to be going into their personal pension as and when they have challenges. No, operate, even if you have to divide your personal pension into two and keep one in the emergency and one in the personal pension, I'm all for it. But it should not be an account that you always feel like going to liquidate, stop, withdraw, no, no. When you do that, for me, you are, you are defeating the purpose for setting up that account for your retirement. You end up having a, a very huge budget on your mind, but by the time you get to your retirement, it's something small because within the period, we're just withdrawing anyhow. Okay, um, Kojo in Kansa Boy, do you can ask your question? Hello. I think you are muted. If you can unmute yourself. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. We can hear you. Okay. Um, um. He started by saying inflation is uh, now twenty nine percent. So, which investment instruments can one comfortably invest in now? I want his advice on it. Okay, so if you ask me, um, for the last, let's say, a month, the table rate has been rising uh, in response to inflation rate. So currently, we have the um, 91 days, 182 days, around 23, 24%. Bond, the last time they issued the bond was around 23%. If you ask me, if you have to choose any of the money marketing investments, then for me, Going in for let's say 91 days at 24%, it, it's not that bad. We should we should also keep in mind that inflation rates are not static. So it's possible that by the time they're even the 91 days, you get into the middle of it, the rate can drop. 
inflation will drop, but you still be getting your 23 percent. So that's where you have to pick the, the uh, discussion from. I know most of the banks' fixed deposits are lower than that. So looking at the money market, all the options are available. I think that the best one for now will be either be going for a 91-day treasury bill or going for a bond. But for me, a bond will not serve that purpose. Looking at how the rate is going up, if you have a 91 days, and it happens that by the time the 91 days is maturing, the rate has increased to let's say 27%, 28%. You can easily do a rollover at that rate. But if you lock up yourself for let's say two years with a bond, you now have to go and liquidate it before you buy another one at a penalty. So for me, currently, looking at all the conditions available, a treasury bond 91 day would be better unless you find a bank that is giving higher than the TBO. Some banks may decide to go TBO plus two plus one. If you get an option like that, then that, that will also be a very good one around this time. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Okay, so we'll take our last question from Kofi Frempong, who's his, his question is, which places do you think I should put in my retirement fund to make more returns? When it comes to your retirement uh, uh, fund, I think the best place for now is secure pension. So you don't have, you don't have to go anywhere. They have a team that can advise you on what to do in terms of how much you need to invest, the returns that they, are, they, they will be giving you at the end of the session. So and I'm sure they will leave out their numbers as part of the, the, the chat box. Kindly call them. Please call them tomorrow morning. Have that discussion. Ask questions. Get be convinced that indeed, what you're about to take, the step you're about to take will yield the desired result. And I, I believe that you'll be fine. Okay, I think um, Kofi has one more question. So Kofi can go ahead. Hello, Kofi. Okay, so I think I think his question has been answered. So um, a lot of you are asking for the presentation to be shared with you. A lot are asking for the um, recording as well. So it will be made available on that on our YouTube channel. We'll share we'll share the link and the presentation as well. Also on your screen, you we have shown how to register for our personal pensions products. So you can register via the email address to client services at securepensionstrust.com or you can call us on 0302-771-248 or 0209-984-904. Alternatively, you can visit us in our office in Accra or Kumasi. The locations are, are shown also. And in terms of contributing, you can use our USSD code star 772 star 308 hash you can pay by cash check or bank transfer also standing order or direct debits the account details are also shown and um, the minimum is a 20 ghana cds or anything that you can give and we'll also be happy to talk to you once again i want to say thank you very much mr bankwa for your time for this very interesting and wonderful presentation i mean it's been very helpful a lot of people are very thankful for this and we are really grateful and we thank you so much and thank you for sparing us your time to speak to us god richly bless you and we pray that god will replenish your work that you have given to us today thank you so much and thank you our audience as well you have been very helpful thank you for joining we hope to see you in our next webinar series. We are really grateful for your time and we wish you a lovely evening. Thank you.